next guest is one of the greatest NBA coaches of all time with 27 years of experience and a coach of the year under his belt. He also adds author to his resume. His new book, Furious George, My 40 Years Surviving NBA Divas, Clueless GMs, and Poor Shot Selection has created a firestorm of controversy. We now welcome George Carl to the desk. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank hey, you Coach. Welcome back to ESPN. Welcome yes, to coach. exactly. Yes. Let's get right into this book. Now, in an excerpt on Carmelo Anthony, you said he was a true conundrum for me in the six years I had him. He was the best offensive player I've ever coached. He was also a user of people, addicted to the spotlight and very unhappy when he had to share it. You also added that Melo is a good player, but not a winner. Coach, why is he not a winner? That's the frustration of coaching him. I mean, the whole thing is the guy is extremely talented. Mm -hmm. Maybe by far the most talented offensive player. But, you know, if you ever asked him to rebound the ball, he could rebound the ball. If you, if you said to, in a game plan, get, go, get 15 off, go get 15 rebounds, he can get 15 rebounds. His skills as a playmaker is good. I mean, may, maybe not great, but good. And, uh, you know, he just, he, he's possessed by being an offensive machine. And coming with that, if you go back to all offensive players in the NBA, there's a, a tug of war probably between player, coach, team, on what is unselfish and what is selfish. And that's kind of what I talked about. We could never get to the point where we could win. I mean, we went to the conference finals and we, got, we had great seasons. And so people forget that Carmelo and, and Denver rebuilt a franchise. And I respect that because I was a part of being a part of his, his building. And the whole thing comes down to is then we get to a point where you want to win a championship. And that walk, that journey is harder than I think, you know, when I went through it the first time, it was difficult. And I think we never got to the point where we wanted to be. Coach, good sports books are usually, I mean, the way it usually happens is an agent will call, hey, we have some interest from a literary agent at the agency. We, if you will, talk and say interesting things and your actual observations, <laughs> we think we can make some money with this book. Would you do that? Media platforms, et cetera, will be available to you. And generally, if the subject, or if the author says uh, yes, the would-be author says yes, they put you together with someone and you're expected to dish. Um, th there's a lot of value in that because that's be some of the best sports writing in terms of those books, happens when it gives fans a kind of peek behind the curtain. Right. And yet, on the other hand, there is, in order to do that, there must be some kind of violation of an implicit trust that you've had with the players, moments that they thought might be private, et cetera. How did you reconcile that before writing this book? Well, I think it's a difficult. I, I, I started writing the book when I was here working at ESPN three years ago. Mm -hmm. And a friend, Kurt Sampson and I, were friends for 25 years, and we, we just talked basketball stories. And the conversation I wanted to have in the book was the conversation with the basketball fan, the basketball coach, the guy that kind of might feel some of the things or might want to know about some of the stories behind the scenes, as you said, behind the scenes. I think when fans see the uncharted waters, what goes on in a locker room, what goes on with a, a losing team, a winning team, a team that's having trouble connecting team, all those things, fans want to know why. And we, we filter that out when we talk to the press. You know, we always filter out whatever, you know, whatever trouble waters is going on on a basketball team. Now that I don't have the filter on, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I can, I can see where you could argue I went too far. But if you read the book, there is 250 pages of good stuff and about 15 or 20 pages of, of maybe I made Max, sure yep. Max's question, I think, is, is, is apropos. Set aside whether or not you were right or wrong on your opinions, your analysis of various right. players. Did it ever occur to you, did you ever, were you ever concerned with this could come off as gossiping or talking behind somebody's back or talking out of school on conversations or perceptions that were supposedly within safe confines? Did you worry about sharing those stories? What is, most of these stories are 7, 8, 10, 15 years old. So how long do you have to stay quiet about talking about the state of the game? I don't know. Did you because, ask yourself that question? Yes, I did. And what was the and, answer? And I, I feel the, the state of the game is unbelievably blowing up. But sometimes fast and big create some trouble, you know, some trouble waters behind closed doors. George, any regrets on some of the things that you did say in the book now that you've heard some of the public backlash? I think you know one thing I've, I've mentioned many times already in some interviews is, a, is the Kenyon Martin part of fatherhood and mm -hmm. Carmelo Anthony by being. It's something I think I, sh I could have talked about better or said better yep. than I did. 
it came off uh, very abrasive and, and bullish a little bit. What did you um, really mean by that point about the players without fathers? What were you trying to say there? We get players at age 19, 20, 21 years of old age, and they, they are thrown on the NBA stage to be a star, and it's difficult. And they get paid millions of dollars now. They have a lot of things off the court, whatever you want to say, branding, you know, interactions. They all have their own workout guy. They have their nutritionist. They have all these things. They have a lot of involvement, getting a lot of opinion. And the coach is the kind of the place, the guy that's managing the information a little bit. And you always want to find a connection with your player. Sometimes that doesn't come from me. It comes from one of my assistants. Sometimes it comes from the trainer. But you want a connection to kind of get a better feel on what makes your players tick. What is his passion? What am I doing wrong? What am I saying that's bugging him? And sometimes, you know, looking at my life, you know, basketball, you know, it was, I mean, without a father, I don't, I, I need, my guy is, I had two fathers. I had a good father, and then I had Dean Smith. And I also went through what I went with my, fa with my son. My son and I had, because of basketball, I went through a divorce, and we grew apart. And that was, that was very difficult. And I think now we've come back together basically because of cancer. So all of these are stories of fatherhood in the book, but that one thing, that excerpt, blew up something that I don't know the answer for other than every day coaches go in the meeting trying to be better, be better emotionally, be, be better physically, and be better, you know, uh, you know, mentally. Making them better is our job. That's our job. Winning and making guys better are our job. And I think the coaches in the league spend a lot of time on the psychology, on the on the motor, you know, and you know, I'm not a big word of motivating because I think players got to motivate themselves. But I think some coaches inspire their teams better than other coaches. And there's that, there's that juice that comes from inspiration that some coaches give to their team and other coaches don't. Coach, there's, um, you know, fans I think are of two minds. At least I am. When I see a situation, for example, like yours, the question always is: if you're not there watching it unfold, how much is this? A stodgy old old school coach who wants it done a certain way and can no longer relate <laughs> to the young players. How much is it of it is this group of young players he has just is leaderless or happens not to be just the right group? How much of it is they need to kind of meet in the middle somehow? I guess the question is, do you feel that generationally you have outgrown the league in terms of being able to relate to the players or to the players being able to relate to you? That's funny because, you know, when I start, first started coaching, I had players older than me. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and now I'm the grandpa in the locker room. I could, I could live with that commentary. Yep. Uh, I'm asking the question. But I, my, I my whole thing is I think players want to get better. I think players want to be led. They, they want to be given a package where they get to be better basketball players. And over my career, I think that's what I did. I gave them a culture of basketball that was fun to play. We won basketball games, and you got, you got coached at a pretty hard level. And I'm not saying, you have to understand, the, the negative, we were, if you, if you go ask, we were positive the majority of the time. But did you, do you ever ask yourself that question? Like, maybe I'm just, maybe like the generation gap is too great nowadays. Do you ask yourself that question? Yes, ever? yes. There's no question that, you know, I'm 65 years old. But they're also, in my mind, I still like to coach. I think I have the edge to coach. I think I'm probably good enough to coach. But in the same sense, you know, what's going on? I don't totally understand it. Is it confusing? Yes. And have I come to that point where maybe I'm done? Yes. But I don't think I'm done coaching basketball. One of those younger generation players that you did coach is DeMarcus Cousins. Uh, news is out that he might be in line for a $200 million extension with the Sacramento Kings. Would that be a contract you would offer him if you were in charge of the Kings? <laughs> uh, that's, a difficult, that's a difficult question because, I mean, Sacramento is a good town. It's a good basketball town. Uh, and the, 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 the losing, the, the, what, eight, nine years of losing, I want them to have a winner. I don't have the answer. I failed in my, my year of trying to find the answer. He's a hell of a player. I mean, I, I mean, I'll be honest with you. There are few players. He's like Melo a little bit. You shake your head at what DeMar DeMarcus Cousins can do as a basketball player. 
But, you know, they got to figure out how they're going to go from where they are now to be in a playoff team to be a winning basketball team. I don't, I one, failed in that answer. One follow-up. You described Carmelo as not a winner, and you said it's because of that tension between selfishness and team. It sounded like, to me, aired towards selfishness sometimes. Where's DeMarcus Cousins on that scale? Is he you know, a winner? I'm going to blame it on the big man. I'm, I'm blaming the game as moving away from the big man. But is he a winner? I think he can be a winner, yeah. His record says he isn't, but I think he can be a winner. But the game is moving away from the big man, and I don't know where that's going to go. Five years from now, is the big man going to get back in the game a little with, with a little more value? Uh, the game, when you play fast and quick and bring the three ball in, is easier. The, the, the statistical evaluation says it's not as good as playing on the low post and going to, going to a big man and playing from inside out. Coach, appreciate your time and your honesty. I don't think you need to worry about promotion for this puck. There's been plenty of it already. Furious George in stores now. Make sure to grab a coffee. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thanks, Thanks, Coach. Appreciate Appreciate it. Coming up on First Take, trust the process. You've heard that before. Joel Embiid had 76er fans buzzing, but don't miss what Max has to say about the Sixers star in his final take. And we have a Cowboy Hall of Famer joining us next. Michael Irvin will chat with us about Dallas and if the Lombardi Trophy is coming back there. Stay tuned. This is First Take. Yo, what's up? This your homeboy, Ice